Hey, people of the MRAP universe, it's time for another uh, COVID update. We actually haven't done one for two weeks because Brit Guest is lazy. <laughs> All right? I'm just saying, she's over it. Uh. So uh, we've actually got quite a few things to go through, but instead of going into a lot of detail, it's basically we're going to give you a very quick summary of the papers and stuff that we're looking at, and then we'll drop the links in the show notes so that you can go dive deeper. So uh, tell us about some vaccine stuff. So there is... A- constantly a ton of information coming out about vaccines. At this point, we know a lot about how the vaccines affect the symptomatic spread of COVID, but we don't have as much information about asymptomatic spread. So this paper here looks at the impact of COVID-19 vaccines on asymptomatic infection amongst patients undergoing basic regular COVID uh, screening. And it was a pretty large study, retrospective cohort study of about 40,000 patients. And really what they found was that once you were vaccinated with one of these mRNA vaccines, about 10 days post your first shot, you had a significant reduction in asymptomatic spread, not just symptomatic, but asymptomatic. It was about an 80% reduction in asymptomatic spread. So that's huge. That's after one dose, 10 days later. That's really amazing. So this next study on vaccines is kind of looking at vaccines in the real world. So it looked at the effectiveness of Pfizer or Moderna um, on preventing COVID-19 amongst healthcare workers. So big, uh, a pretty big study still, prospective cohort, about 4,000 patients, all healthcare workers, so EMS, frontline workers, um, ER doctors. And this was with mRNA given. And what they, sh- what they found was two weeks after the first dose, it was 80% effective at preventing spread of COVID. And two weeks after the second dose, it was 90% effective. So really what we've c- continued to see with those original trials, we're actually seeing in real world ER doctors, EMS, frontline workers. Yeah. So again, just more good news about the mRNA vaccines. We expect similar results from the other ones, but we don't have those studies just yet. All right. And then there's kind of this term that's been going around, this long COVID syndrome. And there isn't really a great definition for this at this point, but it's it's simply patients that get COVID and then they have these lingering symptoms for months, up to five months, eight months, a lot of shortness of breath, fatigue, insomnia. And so there's concern of should these people get the vaccine? Does it make their symptoms worse? Does it make their symptoms better? And we really don't know. This was a pretty small study of about 66 patients. And they used patients that had prolonged symptoms, most of them for about eight months. 44 got vaccinated. 22 got uh, did not get vaccinated. And in the vaccinated patients, they did see that their symptoms of those long-term COVID symptoms did seem to improve and it was safe. So was that just going to happen anyways and incidental? Who knows? But at least it seems safe and probably effective. Yeah, one of the theories is that they've got incomplete clearage of the virus and maybe this helps there and other people think it's an inflammatory, post-infectious inflammatory syndrome, I don't know. But it would be nice for them not to get it again if they've had, you know, symptoms for eight months and then they get reinfected again. Oh my gosh. So Brutal. it appears to be safe. So I'll do this one. This is the AstraZeneca phase three. This is the Oxford vaccine that you've been hearing a lot about. Um, unfortunately, AstraZeneca really has screwed this up in terms of PR and it continue to make little tiny errors that make people like, what are you doing, you people? So they released more of their data and um, a number of countries said, hang on a minute, you look like you've got old data with new data and what are you doing here? So it was actually, they made a mountain, what's it called, a mountain? A mountain out of a molehill. And it turns out that this is actually a very good vaccine, that uh, it was 79% effective overall, but then when they redid their data, it was 76%, so it's still very good. And the key thing, honestly, one of the only things I care about with these is does it reduce death and does it reduce ICU admissions? And this vaccine did a really fantastic job of that. And there was also this concern about whether you get strokes. In this case, they were really worried about cerebral venous thrombosis. And it turns out that when you look at the background rate and then you look at the vaccinated population, there was no difference between those two. So that makes me feel a lot better. So this um, is going to start to roll out and we're going to have a lot of that vaccine as well all over the world. There's still some people that are concerned about this, again, because AstraZeneca has been a little bit weird about the way it's presented its data and not being completely forthright. And it's just silly of them to do that. Now I want to tell you about a bunch of um, antimicro- uh, not antimicrobials. I can't get my words today. Monoclonal. Monoclonal uh, antibodies. So there's been Blaze 1, Phase 3, and I'm not even going to try and tell you what these ones are. Mabity I'm just going to say, mabs. go for the link. <laughs> but if you put two of these together, 
and then you give them to patients, you can significantly reduce death and hospitalization. In this case, about 85% of the time. Regeneron has a cocktail as well. Same thing again. They've got these animo- antibodies. Mabity, 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 mabity <laughs> They put them together and they showed a 70% reduction in death and hospitalization. And then there's phase three of the Comet Eyes trial. Same thing again, as 85% reduction in uh, hospitalization and death. So this is not something you in the ER are going to use necessarily. Maybe you will. But certainly for the inpatient staff, this is significantly reducing these patients going on. And that's good. The initial studies weren't very promising with these sort of single forms. But it turns out it looks like if you put two of these puppies together and give them to the patients, they've got three trials here that suggest it's good. I should say this, though that this was not actually, you know, in a paper. It's not in the New England Journal. All of this is as always right now. Um, we did the study and then we did a press release. So we're doing medicine by, by press release again, which is bad. I think that's important to know about it, though, because for a lot of us, especially when we hit these big surges, we're having these ICU patients or boarding medicine patients in the ER with us for days. So it is a therapy that we might be starting. Hopefully, no further surges, finger crossed. Hmm. Um, okay, so let's talk about kids and COVID. So multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Um, it's something that we you know, don't see very often. It's pretty rare, but it does seem like the case reports are increasing. And there is some concern that some of these newer variants might actually cause more severe disease in children than the previous early COVID strains. So um, more to come on that. I should tell you, uh, this week in virology, I should say this every week all the time, this week in virology has a fantastic clinical update series as well as just the virologist talking. This guy called Daniel Griffith, he does a weekly update and I really suggest that you get that. It's a free podcast. And he's saying just anecdotally um, that the pediatricians and he's in the New York area mm-hmm. are saying they seem to be seeing a significant increase in uh, MIS-C. So um, keep an eye out for it because it might actually be much more common than it was before. Yeah. Um, So keeping in line with kids and school-aged children, uh, they're going back to school. And so we need a little bit more information on how COVID spreads in the school setting. So this uh, paper, it's COVID-19 in primary and secondary schools. So that's K through about 12th grade, um, looking at their first semester back to school Uh, in Florida, August to about December of 2020. And it was a really big study. It registered about 3 million school-aged children. And what they found was essentially less than 1% of the students got school-related COVID. They could have contracted it in the community, but when they seemed to, you know, just look at how they might have gotten it in the school setting, it was less than 1%. Now, the caveat is if you have a ton of COVID in a community where a school district is, there's probably going to be more cases of school related COVID just because it's more prevalent in that community. So the safety of going back to school is probably reflected in how many cases are just in your area. Um, But of course, always good to uh, distance at least three to six feet, wearing masks, all of that definitely help uh, prevent the spread of the infection in the classroom. Yeah, that's a really important point that it wasn't just like everybody go back to school, you'll be fine. It's three feet, good ventilation, good Mm -hmm. testing um, and universal mask wearing. So it was all that put together. And not to mention, most of them were like half day, half Mm -hmm. classroom size. They're not going out and doing a lot of group activities. They're still keeping a lot of distance. So I'll do this one. This was the Inspiron randomized trial. I think we actually already talked about this one. This is you know, standard dose prophylactic anticoagulation for thrombotic events versus using a big slogging huge dose. And in this case, they found that the intermediate dose prophylaxis compared with standard dose prophylaxis did not result in any difference in the primary outcome. So for a while there, because it's a prothrombotic state with COVID, we thought that maybe we should be using much higher doses of heparin. This uh, study doesn't actually support that. And I think that's important because a lot of people have been using pretty big doses and maybe we shouldn't be doing that. In the same way, you know, prothrombotic process, there's been a lot of questions about aspirin. We're waiting for some big trials to come out about uh, aspirin, when we should use it, how much we should use it, which exact patients we should perhaps use it in for prophylaxis. This is a very small study. It's retrospective. It said uh, we gave some people aspirin. We didn't give some people aspirin. And then we went back and looked and see if there was a difference between the two. So it's not really great methodology. But it basically said it looked like it decreased mortality in the ICU. So what that usually tells you is that it's probably safe. Does it really tell you if it's effective or how effective? Not really. But um, more on uh, aspirin in COVID to come. And I think that study, too, is, you know, we're hopeful that aspirin does something. It's cheap. Yes. Uh, It's widely available. Yes. It's generally safe. 
Um, but there was this, you know, they got it 24 hours during admission or seven days prior to admission, how much they actually got. I mean, there are a lot of things that weren't controlled for, but I mean, it seems really hopeful. Like if we just give somebody aspirin and they have less days in the ICU or on a ventilator, I would be happy to give aspirin. It would be huge. We give them a cheap steroid and we give them a cheap non-steroidal. would be Amazing. great. Um, post-acute COVID. So long COVID, there's a really good review here. I won't go into it. It's in nature. And it goes through the syndrome and how frequent it is and what you might be able to do about it. So it is actually a really big deal, mostly for our primary care colleagues, but uh, go check that out. And then risk scoring for intubation and mortality. There is some risk scores that are out there now to suggest who is going to need to be mechanically ventilated and go to the ICU. And I just bring this up because we're going to work on a calculator and get that into the Corpendium chapter that you wrote with uh, who else? Crystal Ives? With Crystal. And about <laughs> 300 other people, honestly, but still. <laughs> Um, it's a team. So that is the update for COVID for March, whatever the time it is, March 30th by the time this comes out. And we will continue to do these and get into the uh, comments section and leave us lots of comments and we'll get back to those when we do this again. I don't know when. Probably we should do this weekly, but, you know, Brit, lazy, <gasps> whatever. I'm out.